is Mr. Stieg Enstrom, uh, who in the press has been called the Scandia man. And Stieg Engstrom is deceased, and therefore I am not able to uh, start proceedings or even interview him, which is why we, uh, my decision is to discontinue this investigation uh, since the suspect is deceased. Now I would like to ask Milano to tell us a little bit about the investigation and how it has been conducted. Well, we can see and say that this is one of the biggest police investigations in the world. It's often compared with the assassination of JFK and even also with the Lopkabi bombing. And if we look to Sweden, then of course it is by far Sweden's biggest criminal investigation ever. And we talk about the murder of two people in Linköping and the laser man and Peter Manx and the Hager man, Peter Manx in Malmö. And none of these investigations are anywhere near as large as the Palmer investigation. Could you please press the button? Thank you. So it's been ongoing since 1986 and has been handled by the Palmer Investigation Group at the Investigations Section at the Department of National Operations. Uh, statistics, people always like statistics, it's interesting, and I suppose we could start by saying that since 2017, we've been uh, working on a project digitalizing this entire investigation. So this is ongoing still, actually, as we speak. and. It's only fairly recently that we've been able to read different documents on screen. Up until now, we've always had to read paper documents. And this is a huge improvement that we can read documents on screen instead. And the investigation contains over 22,430 different entries and I'm saying entries in here, and I know that many people in the media use the word track or lead, lead, and to lead to me that's fingerprint or it might be a footprint or something like that. I'm going to say um, the Swedish word uppslag, which is the word that we've used for a sort of something that is akin to a lead. And a lead might be, uh, or one of these entries, or what we're going to call them, it could, might be uh, an A4 uh, sheet, that, or it might be so many documents that it corresponds to a normal murder investigation. So these entries, or these items, they vary to a large extent. About 90,000 people have been part of the investigation, and also, there are 40,000 people who are mentioned sort of on the periphery. And interviews have been held with over 10,000 people. And many of these have, in fact, been heard several times. And I think the person who's been heard most is a man called Sigurd Siedegrian. He was a well-known uh, owner of a, a cl club and also uh, he was a drug dealer and he was part of this group. He's been heard in fact 43 times in all. And there are about just over uh, 4,000 vehicles included in this investigation, 134 people who have confessed to the assassination and of these, uh, uh, 29 uh, have confessed directly to the police, and the others have confessed to su another person who in turn has then contacted us and told us about it. Now, if we look at the issue of the weapon, this is, of course, a central, uh, interesting part of the investigation. Now, two bullets were found on the road, Sviavi again, after the assassination, first on the 1st of March, on the western part of Sviavergen, and this was a bullet which probably was the one that hurt uh, and injured Lisbeth Palmer. And the second bullet was found on the 2nd of March. This was the bullet that killed the Prime Minister, and that was found just a couple of meters from, from the actual scene. And the bullets are Winchester bullets, metal piercing, 
uh, Winchester bullets, calibre 357 Magnum. And when you say 357 Magnum, then of course it's you kind of think that we're talking about strong, big bullets, but we're not talking about that at all, actually. There's, in Sweden, for example, it's about nine millimeters, actually, and that's the size that is used uh, for a usual uh, rifle in Sweden. Or, uh, uh, I think that slightly longer and, in fact, has more gunpowder in it, uh, stronger charging, which is why the ammunition is stronger. And moreover, the bullets are made of lead with uh, copper as well. And as you can hear from the name, they are to a certain extent um, metal, uh, the metal piercing, have a metal piercing. And that tells us how thick the metal is. Unfortunately, there are very few uh, tracks on the, on the uh, bullets. And also because they have been hit the building and the street, um, they've also been damaged to a certain extent. And the bullets have been examined by the SKL, the Forensic Laboratory in Stockholm, and they've been examined by uh, Bundeskriminalamt in Germany as well, and they've also been to the FBI in the United States as well. And there are so few tracks on them that there is not much to s you can't say uh, even that they've been shot using the same gun. However, there's no doubt that these are the bullets in question that have murdered and injured the couple because the, uh, the lead isotope composition is the same in both of these when it comes to the lead residue on their clothes, both on their clothes and actually on the bullets. So they haven't been put there or been exchanged for anything else. These are the bullets that were used. And the bullets have uh, tracks after uh, the uh, from 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 the gun, and um, that leads us to assume a number of different types of guns that we use that might have been used. And the most common is the Smith and Wesson. Uh, pre earlier, we had a list of seven different. Uh, Makers with Smith and uh, Western Taurus, Yama, Ruby, Escadine, and Kasnar. But l more recently, NFC, the National Forensic Center, has looked more closely at this and arrived at two further uh, makers, and it's it's Kunan and Rugo. And Kuna, we don't think that that comes into question because there are no empty uh, shells on the site, and there is nothing that tells us that the the um, perpetrator or anybody else has picked up any empty shells. Also, there is information telling us that we that this that the weapon was in fact a revolver. And if we then take take a look at the length of the pipe, then that is. In all probability, we're talking about something which is four inches long, that I about 10 centimeters long. And the reason why we say that is that the bullets that have been in this uh, shot from a, a, a shorter gun, they show uh, a different, there are different aspects of the back of the bullet, uh, base extension. And this is a phenomenon that we see when the powder sort of goes f forward into the, the front of the, the, the gun and it's propelled. And the pressure is so great from behind, so it sort of mushrooms, as it were, becomes all, s and we can't see any signs of that on the bullets. So therefore, we can say that it must have been at least four inches in length. And according to NFC, the National Forensic Center, they have tested, uh, test fired 788 weapons and looked at many different bullets to see whether there are any similarities between those bullets and the bullets in question. Now, unfortunately, 
NFC are now saying that it would be very difficult, if it impossible, to link a weapon, an actual weapon, to the bullets. Bearing in mind that the, the tracks on the bullets are, are there are few, they've been damaged, and also bearing in mind what's happened with the gun during the time from then to now, um, it might be that the weapon might uh, give rise to completely different traces on the bullets today than they did in 1986, which is why they don't think that it's possible to link a, a weapon to the bullets in question, unfortunately. I would like to say, to give a couple of brief examples of uh, interesting leads we've been working on in the past years. The first person of interest was the so-called 33-year-old man. This is a man from Blekinge in southern Sweden who at the time lived in Nosbor in southern Stockholm. He was very interested of weapons. He disliked the prime minister. He was uh, at a cafe at Kungsgatan Street at the time, as uh, he would usually do. He talked to other patrons uh, of the cafe, and because of that, and based on the witness statements collected from the other patrons, you could say that he is not a potential perpetrator, because at the time he was at the cafe and couldn't at the same time be at the scene of the crime. Krista Patterson, all of you know about him, a uh, substance abuser from Solentun in northern uh, Stockholm. He was found guilty and then he was acquitted in 1989. He was acquitted unanimously by the Court of Appeal and found guilty by a non-unanimous district court. The Court of Appeal stated that probably he was outside of the Grand Cinema at the time. Elizabeth Palmer has identified Krista Patterson during a lineup. The lineup, you can have different opinions about how the lineup was conducted, and you should also be aware that what Elizabeth Palmer said is that she identified the person who saw who she saw when she turned around and looked up. She didn't see the actual moment of the shooting. She didn't see who fired the weapon, but she says that Krista Petterson is the person she saw when she turned around. It's uh, in, would be interesting to keep that in mind. We have a Krista A. He is, or he was, 33 at the time. He lived at Helsinki Garten Street, not far from the uh, crime scene. He was in legal possession of a Smith & Wesson 357 Magnum, and when he was about to present the weapon, he didn't manage to. He said that he sold the weapon to, to a young person he met at the uh, Kungstra Gordon Park in central Stockholm. We haven't managed to recover this weapon, unfortunately. And Chris uh, is, uh, has passed away. He passed in 2008. These three individuals are interesting for the investigation because these are actual persons who were at least close to the uh, scene of the assassination. Then there is a large number of leads which uh, deal more with the issue of motive. You have an idea about a motive for the assassination, but they have we haven't been managed we haven't managed to link any of the persons to the scene. Just to mention a couple of these leads, we can mention the PKK. It was Hans Holmes, big lead, which he believed a lot. Uh, in PKK, an organization, uh, this is uh, Kurdistan's Workers' Party, and uh, they were fighting with the Turkey for Free Kurdistan at the time. They have committed prior murders in Sweden, one at Medberg Plaza in Stockholm, and one in Uppsala. A large raid against the members of organizations was uh, 
conducted. About 20 people were taken in and were questioned, but they were released because the suspicions against those individuals, individuals were not strong enough. Soon after that, the decision was made that Hans Kulmer would resign from the investigation. South Africa, uh, personally, I believe that this is quite an interesting lead due to quite specific uh, motives. The problem is, uh, is that you cannot get any specific information. South Africa was discussed extensively. A number of people have contacted us uh, providing interesting views with respect to this lead. Unfortunately, there's uh, not enough specific information to do something about this lead. The police theory, this is uh, the a number of leads which have been named to the police theory by the media. It's about the police officers, individual police officers, groups of police officers, sometimes corroborating with other group of professionals, mainly members of the military. Even when it comes to this theory, there's nothing specific which gives us opportunity to, to consider this particular lead. If we go back to 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 today's composition of the Parliament Investigation Group, then I'd like to say that in the June Spring 2016, the major part of the previous group retired. We were six at the time, and four out of the six retired. There was a need to, to recruit new colleagues, so three new colleagues were recruited during autumn 2016. At the end of 2017, beginning to correction, 2016, beginning of 2017, a new prosecutor was introduced to this case, Christopher Patterson, and in February 2017, he was formally appointed as a new prosecutor. The group, the Palmer Investigation Group, consists currently of uh, one head of investigations, two detective inspectors, and one civilian investigator. So a couple of words about how Stig Engstrom, how the investigation became interested in Stig Engstrom. The new group was to be introduced to the case, and I did what I normally do. Uh, you should read the review commission, the inquiry from 1999. And, uh, after this, uh, we started to work on different leads, and we decided also to review the material which had to do partly with the scene of the crime, the incident, and the individuals who were present. And as a result of that, we arrived at a conclusion that there was a person who didn't match the rest of the pattern. There was a person who didn't fit in. His statements uh, couldn't be corroborated by the statements with the statements of the other witnesses. So we started to consider this during the summer of 2017, and during the autumn of 2017, we started to work actively with this issue. And after a short while, we presented this information to the prosecutor, and we were instructed by Prosecutor Patterson to continue to focus on this individual. Having said that, I would like to pass the word to Mr. Patterson. The assassination, there have been a lot of discussions about whether the person who believed to, who was involved in this, whether he acted by himself or whether this was part of a conspiracy. And we have spent a lot of time trying to map other groups, persons, and uh, events in the time prior to this nation to trying to find traces of a conspiracy. You should be noted there were a number of interesting persons, interesting groups, but we haven't been find, able to find any support for the conspiracy theory. But it couldn't be 
rejected completely he was part of a larger conspiracy. Just like Hans mentioned initially, this small Palmer group, uh, the Palmer group wasn't as small as it has been recently. A large number of uh, policemen was involved from the start. And as you normally do in large murder investigations, you work with different suspects, different individuals, different leads, and everything should be done more or less in parallel. Different theories were given different degrees of importance, and therefore the relation of the witness statements were was done differently compared to how we would have done this today, or maybe some of the statements of the people who uh, claimed that they were at the scene, their statements were not assessed at all. Um, it should be noted that this assassination took place uh, and a large number of people saw the entire course of events or parts of the course of the events and we have received very different statements from the witnesses, but there is one comprehensive picture, which was a comprehensive statement, which we are, uh, which we believe is, which comes from all the witnesses, is that the uh, murderer ran westwards on the Tullagotten Street. The description of the assassin has. Uh, varied based uh, over time and also uh, between the statements of the different witnesses. Very few, if uh, anyone at least uh, saw the face and could provide a description of the face of the uh, assassin, but uh, some of the people have written comments on how the alleged perpetrator was uh, dressed. What has uh, made the investigation more difficult for us is that more than 34 years have passed since the uh, assassination and uh, people, a number of people are maybe no longer with us or maybe they are very old. Oral evidence which uh, it doesn't improve over time. This is something which should be served fresh and as Hans said, we hoped to to get uh, clear indications from the NFC National Forensic Center, but the NFC says that based on today's technology, possibly it won't be possible to tie a weapon to the murder scene. So therefore, what we have to work with is more or less the same forensic evidence as the evidence which was secured at the time, at the time of the assassination. What uh, also did make uh, this investigation easier is the big involvement on the media and the big uh, influence of the media on the witnesses. There has been a lot of interest uh, at the time of the assassination. There were a large number of articles in newspapers. The witnesses were interviewed by the media. Photos of the witnesses were published. and. Uh, their statements were uh, reported in the uh, newspapers. And we noticed that the statements given by the witnesses would vary a lot between the initial interviews and what has happened later once they have uh, read what the other people have said and once they've seen photos of the people at the scene. So this is something which made our investigation work more difficult. So when it comes to the conclusion with respect to the perpetrator, I've been, I have mentioned the standards of proof and the prosecutor is not a court. And it should be noted that the forensic evidence will not provide us with any assistance from the way it looks like. But it's the way it is. The forensic evidence is what we have here. So therefore, we have to assess what happened at the time based on the existing materials. So if we go specifically to the information given about the man on the run or the perpetrator, as we claim, it should be noted that several of the witnesses who were interviewed initially and also later, they mention 
a person who was wearing a longer jacket or a coat. And uh, this uh, came more or less from all the witnesses. This was a longer jacket. At least the jacket, the length of the jacket was below the waist. And this was a winter night. And then the information about whether this person was wearing a headgear, this information has varied between the witnesses. Some some people said that he had bare head, some, some said that he had a knitted cap, some said that he was wearing a cap. Some of the witnesses uh, have become very important to this investigation, but maybe uh, the atten attention paid to them wasn't as great as their statements uh, actually deemed. There was a Mr. Lashi Yepsen who was at the Tunnelgarten Street, at the intersection of Tunnelgarten Street, Ludmachagarten. I will go through the statement later, but unfortunately, the description of the person he sees running past him on Tonalgana Street is a bit vague. Uh, one thing he was sure of, though, and that is that the man who ran away, that he did, he was wearing a cap, in fact. Another witness, which was very interesting, is Yvonne Nieminen. She was at the top there on Brunkebeis Ridge, on David Bargas Gata, the street. She also talks about a person that she meets dressed in a longer uh, coat with a smaller bag as well. And I'll say more about Nieminen later because this is also central to the investigation. Now, the, now this person, Stieg Engstrom, what he told the police, he said well, how he was dressed at the time when he made his observations he said that he was wearing a knee length dark coat he was wearing a cap he was wearing glasses and he had a, a wrist bag a wristlet a small bag that he had around his wrist he's 182 centimeters uh, in height weighs just over 80 kilos and was at the time 52 years old and he uh, was often in the media. We saw here, for example, this is how he, he said he was dressed on the night of the assassination. So what he tells us about how he was dressed does in fact correspond uh, uh, with many of the information, much of the information provided by the the witnesses, the coat, the cap, and also the small wrist bag that Yvonne Niemannen mentioned. And when we've gone through the material, what is odd is the fact that none of the other witnesses who were on the scene of the crime have recognized Stieg Engstrom at all as having been there at all on the scene of the crime. As I will go back and say later as well, he did he did go back and say what he did on the scene of the crime and how he acted. But if he has been there, he's disappeared. He disappeared before he made any impression on any of the witnesses who were on the scene of the crime because nobody has been able to give any information with regard to Stieg Engstrom. Now, if we look at the information that he has provided with regard to how he acted that night, does in fact, or is consistent with we, how we believe the perpetrator, the assassin, has reacted or acted that evening. Now, Stieg Engstrom, he wasn't a focal point of the investigation, but we've looked at his background. And what we can see there is that he was used to using weapons. He uh, had been employed by the military, by the army. He was a member of a shooting club. And in where he lived, he was also a part of a circle which was very critical of the prime minister. People, <coughs> I mean, his relatives and people who knew him described him as uh, having a very negative view with regard to Olof Palme and his politics. And that's what these circles uh, spoke of. And, and we also know that he had financial problems for um, a long period of time. 
and also something that increased in time was that he uh, had a problem with alcohol and he was in fact he received care for that as well actually now the weapon the gun has been discussed a lot and Stieg Engstrom as I said did know how to handle a weapon with his military background <coughs> and also his membership of a shooting club however having said that there's we can't actually put a specific gun in his hands as it were but what we have been able to say is that somebody in his neighborhood uh, in media they took talked about the arms collector the weapon collector he had a room full of guns he was a collector and we have uh, retrieved at least one gun which corresponded to the caliber of that we suspect was used during the uh, crime unfortunately we didn't receive a positive response from the NFC and then we believe that he must have had a gun in his hands that evening bearing in mind what happened in different contexts and not perhaps in detail but in many words he's told many people about his what he did that actual evening and and according to them he was working late it was a Friday evening and he was working very hard he was at his office all evening and he didn't go out at all however there is information in the Uh, we got a break in link there. We'll try to go back uh, when we're able to, but... Uh Mais le besoin de mesures politiques compétentes est aujourd'hui tout aussi important qu'il ne l'était pendant la première phase de cette crise. Les décideurs politiques ont pris des mesures déterminées pour amortir le choc sur l'économie en plaçant l'économie dans ce qu'on pourrait appeler un coma artificiel. Mais ces mêmes décideurs font désormais face au défi titanesque de ramener le patient à la vie et ce de manière rapide. Et les politiques qui seront décidées 